Well, without any further ado, let me, uh, th let me get things underway by wishing everybody uh, a good morning. Um, my name is Donald Baker. I'm the Executive Dean of Virginia Commonwealth School of Arts here in Doha. I have two tasks. They won't take very long. The first one is to welcome you uh, to the campus. Um, as my friends from Louisiana would say, uh, I would like to welcome y'all, y'all, because y'all is singular. Y'all, y'all is plural. My second is to introduce uh, today's moderator, Professor Kimberly Guthrie, who is chair of our Department of Fashion Design, and she's going to introduce our distinguished uh, guest. I do want to say a few words about Kim, uh, because she's a star in her own right. Uh, despite her youthful looks, uh, she has been teaching fashion and filling administrative leadership roles uh, for over 25 years, maybe longer, I'm not sure. That was what she confessed to on the website. Uh, her research focuses on sustainability in the fashion industry and on developing and restructuring courses that prepare the next generation of fashion designers to develop a apparel utilizing sustainable design approaches and strategies. Um, her focus uh, in both her teaching and her research is on sustainable strategies for fashion design. I mention that because our fashion design program is not just about designing clothes, it's really about preparing people to enter into the entire clothing industry. Kim is also the founder and director of VCU's Fashion in Florence summer program, and this year she is, in addition, directing the students' annual fashion show here in Doha. So with that, let me welcome both uh, our guest and Kimberly to the stage. Hi. So good morning, and thank you all again for waiting. Does everyone have a headset that needs one for translation? I guess they've had lots of time to get their headset. They don't speak English. <laughs> yes, they do. <coughs> um, so we're going to do a talk, the fashion talk, for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to have 15 minutes for questions from the audience. And I do ask that if you ask a question, to please limit that question to 60 seconds or less, OK? All right, so let's get started. We've been so excited. All right, first of all, I want to apologize. I was oh. taken in another place. So it's not that I'm rude. I don't want anybody to think <laughs> I'm rude. OK, just a little bit of background on our lovely guests. Welcome, Ms. von Furstenberg. Uh, you are a designer, uh, a fashion designer, an entrepreneur, and a philanthropist, but most likely known as a cultural and social icon who forever changed women's fashion in 1974 when you created your famous wrap dress, a garment which came to symbolize power and independence for an entire generation of women. DVF relaunched in 1997 and is a global luxury brand offering a full collection of ready-to-wear and accessories. In 2005, you received the Lifetime Achievement Award for the, from the Council of Fashion Designers of America for your impact on fashion, and the following year, you were elected president of the CFDA. In 2015, you were then named chairman of the organization. Diane's commitment to empowering women is expressed not only through fashion, but also the philanthropy and mentorship. She sits on the board of Vital Voices, a non-governmental organization that supports female leaders and entrepreneurs around the world. In 2010, with the Diller von Furstenberg Family Foundation, Diane established the DVF Awards to honor and provide grants to women who display leadership, strength, and courage in their commitment and causes. In 2014, she published a memoir, The Woman I Wanted to Be. And in 2015, she was named one of Time 100 Most Influential People. And today we have her on stage at VCU Arts in Qatar, and I'm so excited! Thank you. So thank you to QM for their help in getting this organized, and we're just gonna, we're gonna get into this. Are you ready? Fantastic. All right. Your icon iconicness has been compared to that of Coco Chanel. Um, you have always spoke that fashion was your door to independence. Most of the audience here knows that you are famous for this garment that has truly celebrated the freedom to be feminine. So, and we've heard about how you want to empower women. Your award, your DVF award is in its 10th year. 
Before we jump off the diving board and get into the fashion pool, I want you to talk a little bit about the importance of your award and the importance of philanthropy. Um, well, uh, when I started as a, as a, when I was a little girl, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew the kind of woman I wanted to be. And the doors took me through fashion and through this little dress, I became the woman I wanted to be. I became independent. And because it was a dress, it allowed me, the more confident I was becoming, the more confident I would make other women by making these dresses for them. So even though there was no social media at the time, it was very much a dialogue that I had with women all my life. And women is my mission. What I was lucky to have for myself is really what I want for every woman. And that goes not just by providing them beautiful clothes that will be her friends in the closet, but also in, well, in philanthropy, you know, helping women, rewarding women, giving exposure to women who have had the strength to fight, the courage to survive, and the leadership to inspire. But it's also, now that I'm a much older woman, it's also about, about talking to women and making them realize, because I've never met a woman who is not strong. They don't exist. It's just that sometimes we hide it for whatever reason. But what I think is important is that everyone knows that it's there. And, um, and that somehow is my mission. It's a beautiful mission. Um, so you're also well known for your prints, another thing that the, the audience knows. And I'm very lucky that several years ago, I got to work with a couple of your people, Neil Gilks and Daniel Reynolds, uh -huh. on a beautiful print project. And I know that your favorite print, at least I think I know, that of yours is your chain link print. You've mentioned that before. So I kind of want to know what your favorite prints are and why, and what is the what inspires you about developing prints and uh, the stories that go behind some of those other well, prints. The story that goes behind is that I, everything I learned, I started from working for a man in Italy, in Como, who had the print factory. So I learned everything about taking an illustration, put it in repeat, um, the different type of prints, um, uh, working with colorists. And in Italy at the time, when you work with the workers in the factories, they were artisans. They, if they were colorists, their father was a colorist, the grandfather was a... I mean, it's all, you know, the residual of the Silk Road that ended up in Como, in this place where they made silk. So there was a lot of... <clears throat> there was a lot of knowledge that I learned. So the first print I did is I had a sponge with ink and I, and I went like that, and I threw ink on with the sponge, and that became my ink, ink, ink spot print. Um, but prints, I know, I mean, I must have done in my life over 10,000 prints. I know them all. I, I, I recognize them. You can't cheat me on them. <laughs> uh, so print is very much a part of what I do. I always have my camera with me, and I always take pictures of architecture. There's plenty of pictures to take here, uh, <laughs> of nature. And a lot of the things that I see in nature then become prints. Fantastic. And of course, those prints have to get printed onto a fabric. And this fabric in itself is iconic. And if it wasn't for that fabric and that mill in Italy that you got your jersey, we wouldn't have this dress. So my next question to you then is, because we have a lot of fashion students uh, in the audience, is uh, what do you find now exciting and innovative in the textile industry today? Oh, well, there's a lot of exciting thing. I mean, for example, they, they now create fiber 
out of, in the lab. So you don't need to take anything away from nature. Um, so there's an incredible amount of technology happening and needed. And uh, I mean, the times have changed. In the printing factory in Italy, they used to throw the dye on Lake Como. I mean, they used to just throw the dye. And then the mayor used to come to the factory and complain, and he would get a, an envelope full of cash. I mean, so, you know, now you talk about this, it's, it's very different from what I actually saw with my own eyes. I think there was a quote that I read about you. I think you said, fashion is inspired by nature, therefore we should respect nature. Nature, I mean, if you think about it, everything we eat comes from nature. Everything we shelter ourselves from, everything we build, everything we do comes from nature. And we never, we're never taught how do we replenish it, how we, you know, so it's important. So your prints are super iconic, and of course everybody sometimes, unfortunately, wants to copy them. And you've been an outspoken person about knockoffs in the fashion industry. And you famously fought against some of those fast fashion brands. So what is your advice or guidance to these young people who need to be, you know, be careful about not being too literal about their ins inspiration and, you know, causing some okay, appropriation? Okay, so I fought, when I, when I first led the CFDA, I went to Washington and I, I found out what it means to lobby and uh, I spoke to a lot of senators in order to get, you know, um, some kind of legislation for protection. I totally failed. I totally failed in, in getting a law. But what I did do is I made so much noise about it that fast fashion and, you know, those inexpensive lines realize that it's not about knocking off, but they should also hire a designer. So to some degree, I was helpful there. Uh, but anything good gets knocked off. You just, you know, you also have to take it as a compliment. That's what Ms. Coco Chanel said, correct? Uh, so going back to your days, we're going to talk about the Council of Fashion Designers really quickly. Um, yes, it's based in New York, but of course its impact is is global, um, and we know that now Tom Ford is beginning his tenure, and so I'm wanting and curious to know what are some immediate effects you think he will have, and in what ways do you think he'll change the CFDA? All right, so it took me about one year to convince Tom Ford to take my job, so I'm very happy that he finally decided to do that, and um, when I came in there, <clears throat> I wanted very much to turn it into a family. So I was very much a mother. And, uh, and now I think they need a statesman. And he's just going to be that. Perfect. I love that answer. Uh, so going back to fashion and to our people out here, which you're trying to, I know you are inspiring. What are the most important issues facing the fashion industry today, right now, and into the future? And what do you hope that they will do that maybe hasn't been done or could be done differently? Well, like anything else, like every industry, like everything, everything is changing so much. The way you sell, the way who you sell to, the internet has changed everything. So if you have a big company, it's really hard because you, you have to change. And you know, it's harder to change when you're big than when you're small. <clears throat> um, so I think that my advice is to try to make sense, to try to think whatever product that you want to do, that you're doing, do I bring anything new? Do I bring anything fresh? Do I think there's a return of using craftsmen? There's definitely a return going back you know, to making things in a smaller way. Um, so the most important thing really is to be authentic. Because if you're authentic, even if you make a mistake, it's your mistake. The worst is to make a mistake, 
because you did what you didn't really want to do, but what you thought you should do. Then it's a complete waste. Going, so going back to being true to yourself and finding your voice, we really try to encourage our students to stay true to themselves and do what, do what they love. And there's, I'm gonna, this is my last question before I let the audience start asking. So you said that your company is called DVF, and you have these names for DVF. You have Diva, Viva, and FIFA. And I want you to know if you would share just a little bit about your inner uh, voices. I did the... Uh, uh, a few years ago, I did a collaboration with Wonder Woman. I love Wonder Woman, right? She is everything I want to be. And, uh, and so I, I developed this little cartoon, these three women and uh, three girls, completely different. And one is Diva, and she's a banker, and uh, she... And all the men that they're, they're, they're working on a mergers and acquisition, and the guys, you know, push her aside. And so she goes to the bathroom, and she goes to the bathroom. And while she looks at her in the mirror, uh, I come with Wonder Woman in the mirror, and I say, "Go for it. Don't worry. Don't be afraid." She goes out, and she's very strong. She makes the deal. And then the second one is DV Viva. And Viva is a little singer. And she works in a band with her brother. And she sings. And all the guys are really rude to her. And they treat her badly. And the same. She goes to the bathroom, goes in the mirror. And Wonder Woman and I are waiting for her. And I say, don't be afraid. And she comes out and she gets a record deal. And the third one is a FIFA. And FIFA is a mother at home. She lives in the suburb. She has many children and a husband. And she's cooking breakfast. And the children, they say, mom this, mom that, and the husband this and that. And she's fixing everything for everybody. And then they all go to school and, and, and to work. And she's like, oh, I have no life, whatever. And she goes to her bathroom, and there's Wonder Woman and I waiting for her. And she said, yes, be the woman you want to be. And so she registered for a recipe uh, contest for, I don't know, uh, um, salad dressing. <laughs> and she wins. <laughs> Voila. So that was the story of those three little Livia. Well, I do think you are a Wonder Woman, so I'm going to share you, and I'm going to let the audience uh, have an opportunity to ask some of their questions. Oh, you can't be shy. <laughs> After all I told you. Here. Right there. <coughs> Hi, Diane. Uh, my name is Fazia. Welcome to Qatar. We are delighted to have you. Uh, I'd like to know um, a man and a woman um, who has truly inspired you and your work. In New York? In your work. In your work. A man and a woman. Okay. So, the man who really inspired me in New York. Uh, well, probably, I mean, Yves Saint Laurent was the, the designer that I loved most and, uh, um, and who was truly inspiring because of his colors and, and, and the way he loved women and looked at women. And a woman, oh, but then, of course, I, I, the man who owned the factory that I worked for, he was a big mentor to me, so I can't forget him. And a woman who inspired me, mm, all women inspire me. Uh, all women inspire me. When, when I had my, uh, it was 40 years of my, my wrap dress four years ago, and I had a big exhibition in Los Angeles, and, and I had all these women wearing you know, the wrap dress. And I remember I had the picture of Michelle Obama 
who was the first lady, and she picked that dress to be on her first Christmas card. And next to her, I had Amy Winehouse, the rock star, who was wearing the same dress two weeks before she died of an overdose. So I just thought, they're so different, and yet they picked the same dress. Hi, Diane. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so my question for you is, I'm actually wearing one of your dresses. I can't and, see. And um, I've pretty much had two babies uh, wearing this dress on different occasions. So I've grown in and out of this dress. Did you envision when you made this wrap dress that it would be the dress that it is today? Or is that something that you never thought of when you were designing? You know, people say I made the wrap dress. Really, the wrap dress made me. Uh, I had no idea. It started with a little wrap top, which was very similar to what uh, ballerinas wear over their tutu. And uh, I wore, I, I made that wrap. I mean, it's that wrap dress. I've sold tens of millions of them. I mean, I, I, when I started, I was 22. So my mother was 45, so my mother wore it, people older than my mother wore it, and then my, children, my daughter, and now my granddaughter. I mean, I, in my own life, I've already covered so many generations. And talking about you being pregnant in it, I will tell you a story is, um, you know who Anne Hathaway is, the actress who did, um, you know what she did, the movie, what? David Pasprada. Okay, so uh, I know her, and she and I were hosting something together. She introduces me to her mother, and her mother says, you know, I'm going to tell you something that I've never told her. And she said, I seduced her father in the wrap dress. <laughs> and then, two seconds later, she said, as a matter of fact, I conceived her in it. <laughs> So Anne Hathaway, and, I, and she doesn't care that I say it. She's very <laughs> proud of it. And uh, so she's. Uh, hello, what's your uh, favorite uh, type of fabric? Linen, silk, cotton? My favorite fabric? My favorite fabrics are fabrics that feel soft. I love, I mean, I don't like hard fabrics. I am very, you know, I like body language. I like fabric that can be draped, that can be used in bias. Bias cut is, is the greatest invention because it makes a woven fabric feel like jersey. I love jersey. Um, you know, Christian Lacroix, the designer, once told me, he said, you know, men designer make costume, women designer make clothes. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, look at, for example, jersey. No man jersey likes, no man designer likes jersey, because if you look at jersey versus a beautiful satin, clearly the satin is more beautiful. But a woman knows the, the faculty of jersey. And if you think about it, whether it's Coco Chanel, or Madame Grey, or Vionnet, or Norma Kamali, or Donna Karen, or Sonia Riquel, or DVF, all, we all use jersey. So I would say that women designers like fabric that feel comfortable. Um, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, very much for being here. And I just want to comment on how your designs are being elevated. So the wrap dress, I actually have a wrap suit now that's yours. And it's so nice to see the dress elevating into a suit nowadays. And uh, my question for you is, I've, I've seen your catwalk shows. 
I, I like, uh, I know in fashion it's very important how you present your collection and I've, uh, I've noticed that the, sometimes the show is a very minimalist and like in its venue and it's the thing, the sitting and uh, do you do, I just was wondering, do you do that to put the focus on the collection itself? Because for me, some venues become, you know, sometimes distracting, but in, in your case, the catwalk is like, I think all about the collection. Okay, so I used to do very big shows, yeah. and, uh, and, but shows used to be very much for the trade, right? So you did shows for the trade six months in advance, and you had a few journalists, and they would take a few pictures, and they would write it, they would put it in the magazine, and you waited. Now things with the internet, everything has changed. Because with Instagram, if you have a big show, it's completely out there in the universe immediately. And people will only have it in six months. So for me, it doesn't make any sense anymore to do it that way. Because especially me, I, I'm, I do prints, then they, the prints get there, they can blow up, they can copy it. And before I know, you know, it's, it's, it's being copied. For small designers, it's even worse, because if they have something good, it will get copied before they can ship it. So I, I have, I, and, it's, and especially because I led the CFDA, I couldn't really change everybody all at once. So I kept on saying, everybody should do what they want, but don't spend all your marketing money so far in advance. So me now, what I do is I've started to show to the trade in a very private, intimate way, so it doesn't get spread into the world. But at the same time, I probably will start doing big fashion shows again, but that are more for, also for the press, but also for the consumer, so that people can buy them no, no later than two months from then. Where? Sure. Well, my, my question comes in actually is, links very nicely and with what you've just said. I was going to ask you, given your long career, what's your feeling of shows like Project Runway? attempt over 12 or 13 weeks to produce the next best designer on the planet. How, how seriously do you take it? I think it's very nice. I think it's very nice because little children can find out how you do it, the pressure, how do you make it. I think it's, it's uh, I mean, sometimes they're better than others and sometimes they, but I think it's good. Anything that will teach people how to make anything is good. That's good. I love that show. <laughs> I, I was wondering, uh, given your, your wonderful years and your success, um, and for our students in the audience, there have probably been some pitfalls and some mistakes along the way, and what advice could you give them about get, getting into the business and going okay, forward. Okay, I have made more mistakes than anyone, and I still do. Uh, I've had a career that I started really young with knowing so little, and I was projected into success. Wow. So at the age of 26, I was making 25,000 dresses a week with no experience, nothing, and so constantly run after myself, whatever. So yeah, I learned really while the bullet train was going. And, um, and then I, whatever happened, this and that, then I sold the company. 20 years ago, I started again. They destroyed it, the people I sold it to. I, I started again, and again I, boom, it went up. And then I thought, okay, well now, I should think about the legacy, and I should, you know, have somebody else. And then I hire this person with great experience, and then he messed it all up, he <laughs> did some terrible things. 
I mean, it's, you, you make a lot of mistakes, especially if you are an entrepreneur. Because entrepreneurs are so used to do everything themselves that they are probably very bad executives. And, um, and then I, I hired a designer who tried to be completely different, and that is wrong too. You have to go back to your core. You have to stand for who you are. And there are times that people say, oh, but it's not hip anymore. Or you should not look at left and right. You should do your thing. So there's a lot of, I mean, it's never easy. There's no such thing as happiness or success. Because the minute, you know, sometimes you are at the peak of your success and everybody thinks you're super successful, but you yourself know that it's not so good because you know what's going on in the inside. And the same way, sometimes people think, oh, she is a has-been. And you know that's not true either because you also know where you're going. So the most important thing, and that, by the way, is the one lesson you can give anyone for anything at any age in any country is the most important relationship in life is the one you have with yourself. And as long as you have that, and you own it, you make a mistake, own it, face it, deal with it. Your imperfection, own your imperfection, they become assets. Hi, Divya. <laughs> Hi, Divya. Hi, how are you? Right here. I'm right here. Uh, I was wondering, uh, the same contest that you're talking about right now, is how did you uh, work with your personal life and your work life together, and how did you uh, stay so consistent in both? Oh. <laughs> <coughs> because my family, because many years have passed, right? Because my children are parents themselves, because my grandchildren are already in university, at least two, two of them. I can actually look back and say with pride that I did well. If you ask me the question when they were teenagers, I probably thought I was doing a really bad job. So um, again, you know, when you have children, the best thing you could do is speak the truth and tell them the truth. And if you are working, you work, they go to school, you have your responsibility, they have theirs, then you talk, talk, share them with you, with you, and, um, you know, and then of course there's the husband, that sometimes is harder than the children. <laughs> and uh, you just have to, you know, use your wisdom and, and your heart and your passion and be strong without being threatening. And um, the most important thing is that you know you're strong. So if you feel it inside, then you can deal with it in ways that are not too uh, threatening. Unless we have one more, we're gonna have to, okay, one more. <coughs> Hello, I was just wondering about um, when you started your business with no experience, how you managed um, putting in capital into your business and whether you started, yeah. Very good question. Well, I was lucky that I started with this man who had this factory and this plant, and he believed in me. So in a sense, he financed me because he made the, the, first he made the samples, and then when I got order, he made the clothes, and he would give me very good terms, so I would be paid before I pay him. And that's how I kind of financed myself. So I, I, a good advice if you are, if you, a good advice is be very close to whoever makes the product. You know, uh, whether they are craftsmen people, or, but 
the source of who makes it, the closest you could be with those people, the better chance you have to make it. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Can I ask oh, a question okay. to you? So, how many of you want to be fashion designers? And um, how many of you think you will make it? Good. All right, go for it. Good luck. <laughs>